Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are Dr. Larry Dossi and composer, conductor, Paul Chihara. Dr. Larry Dossi graduated with honors from the University of Texas at Austin and worked as a pharmacist while earning an MD degree from Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. He is a boy from the deep Texas, <laughs> Texas center of the, of the state, right? He was the executive director of the journal Alternative Th um, Therapies in Health and Medicine. He's written nine books, uh, the most remarkable being Healing Words, which was a New York Times bestseller. He'll tell us about that book, as well as his latest book, The Power of Premonitions. And welcome. It's great to be with you, Joan. Thank You're you. from the Southwest still. Yeah, you can tell probably from the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the accent. I can't get rid of it. I've tried over the years. Well, welcome to L.A. What, uh, let's talk about Healing Words a little bit. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that book and the spirituality of it all and how work and uh, your mind mm -hmm. come together. Mm -hmm. Well, I began to focus on this issue of spirituality and health because of uh, that little four-letter word, uh, data. Uh, the uh, evidence shows that people who follow some sort of spiritual practice in their life live on average 7 to 14 years longer than people who don't. That much? Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> really astonishing. <laughs> people really don't understand the contribution of spirituality to how long you live and how healthy you are. Well, why would you come across this data? You're pretty steeped in Western medicine. I mean, your well, I whole life was life. that, right? Of course. Yeah. Yep, yep. Well, I read widely, and I've always had an interest in spirituality in my personal life. <laughs> but, you know, back when I was in medical school, you couldn't mention this. I mean, it was like oil and water. Uh, you know, you farmed out spirituality to priests and ministers and all of right. that, and doctors did the, the physical stuff. But those days are gone forever. I'll give you an example of how transformational this has been. Back when I wrote that book in 1993, Healing Words, only three of the nation's 125 medical schools had any sort of coursework looking at the connection between spirituality and healing. Right. Now, 90 of the nation's 125 schools have formal courses looking at this. So it's made a huge difference, I'm happy to say. Do you think you were in the forefront of doing this and helping with that kind of thing? Well, I, I think so. And uh, I wasn't sure it was going to take. I mean, I did this with some trepidation. But, you know, a lot of people feel much more comfortable if their doctor has this feeling of God or some higher being I think you have more confidence in your doctor. Well, most people do. Studies show that people want that. Yeah, uh, you know, recently, it's, it's yeah, it's comforting. It it, it just brings a sense of uh, uh, certainty and satisfaction and confidence in people's lives. Well, while you were studying your medicine at at uh, med school, you were working as a pharmacist and you were dispensing. Uh, what oh, drugs? <laughs> big time. Uh, yeah. But do, does that kind of um, fall into what you're doing? Well, I mean, do you d disband drugs, or do you still feel they're okay? Well, pe some people <laughs> want to do that, but I don't. I, uh, I've spent my life as an internist, you know, using I think medications responsibly and referring people to surgery when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. So I think they're all a blessing, you know, whether it's spirituality or drugs or surgical procedures, I think we ought to use what works. Yeah, and that's what Healing Words has to tell us. So from Healing Words, it kind of morphed into premonitions, I guess. Yeah, it did. Uh, actually, the, the, the morphing was a little shocking to me, frankly. <laughs> was it? Yeah, it wasn't very smooth. <clears throat> Why? Because I didn't want anything to do with this premonition business. Uh, you know, I, I 
I thought that uh, this would not be the best way to advance your career in medicine. And I thought that I would probably get run out of uh, polite meetings, you know, if I talked about this openly. So I was really, uh, I went into this sort of kicking and screaming. But, but, but you took yourself in. Well, I did because Didn't of, you? guess what, a premonition. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> what happened? I had one of these suckers. Uh, it took the form of a, a dream one night, which at the time I thought may have been the most vivid graphic dream I've ever had in my life. It was uh, a dream in which mm -hmm. I saw events played out the next day in the life of a young four-year-old kid. Oh, I read that in your book. Yeah. That's right. Tell us about it. Well, he was the son of one of my physician colleagues. And I saw a test being done on him uh, in this dream. Uh, a technician was trying to do something to his head. The kid just went berserk. Uh, the mother, standing at his side, couldn't control the boy. Finally, the technician just said, I quit, turned around, and walked away. This was the dream. This and is I in your it was dream, yeah. Silly and trivial, but it was so vivid. I went to work the next morning, saw patients in the hospital, and uh, at noon, I was lunching with the father of this child. When his wife comes in carrying this boy, <gasps> his, his head is wet, he's been crying, he's really upset, and she describes my dream essentially to her oh, husband uh, as I was sitting there. Uh, they had just come from a laboratory where a technician was trying to do a brainwave test on this child, and he just went nuts, fighting her and everything. Finally, she just abandoned the test. So I had dreamt this in really graphic detail uh, before it even happened, and it really unnerved me. Was that... Um better for the child that they had disbanded the test? Well, uh, actually, it didn't matter because uh, he had had a seizure the day before. Oh, he was I sick, see. and they were just doing the test to prove he didn't have a brain tumor. So. so so, here you had these things going on. Then why? You could have just kept that in your mind and talked to your friends about it. Right. Why write the book? Because I couldn't get away from premonitions. <laughs> uh, my patients started telling me their premonitions. Their dreams of illness. Some of them were so uh, accurate that it was scary. They would come in and would do the test, and they would confirm the test would confirm what they'd seen in their dreams. Nurses in the hospital, when they found out that I had a sort of an interest in this, they began to tell me their premonitions and experiences with their own patients. And finally, the straw that really pushed me into putting my name on this book <laughs> was that doctors came forward themselves and began to share their experiences with me. Were they keeping it a secret, or do you think it was something no. that once the word got out, they could come and talk to you about it? Well, they knew that if they opened up to me, I wouldn't put them down or humiliate them oh, I and see. embarrass them. And so they would share this with me privately, uh, which is interesting because I think doctors are sitting on so much interesting information about premonitions and so on that they really need to open up, not only to get the word out, but for their own mental health. Well, for their own mental health, but I sometimes you think that they're, they don't become so involved because they don't know how to release just what you're talking about. That's true. And so if we can make a safe space yeah. for them so they can do this without being publicly embarrassed, embarrassed. that's what we need to do. You know, I went through the same thing with the prayer thing. Oh, with uh, the healing words? Yes. Yeah. And so doctors didn't want to talk about spirituality, but once the book was out and it became sort of okay to do this, and they knew about the evidence favoring spirituality and health, doctors all over came forward to begin to talk about this. But it becomes data, just like you said, because if you can start um, having all these things written down and you can see the results, then that's what you're going for. I started reading the book, and you have to explain to our viewers uh, ESP, mm -hmm. telepathy, clairvoyance, precognitive thinking. Right. Those are all part of what you're talking about. Well, yes, that's correct. So uh, let's talk about those. Actually, the big umbrella is something called extrasensory perception. You know something without see, touch, heal, feel, touch, uh, and, and so on. You know it. You just know it. Clairvoyance is just knowing things at a distance. Oh, uh, it is? Yes. Oh. Telepathy is connecting with somebody else's thoughts at a distance. Precognition or premonitions is knowing something before it happens. So these oh, are the three major oh. divisions of ESP. Oh, I see. So you're talking about something before it happens. Right. I That's see. a premonition uh, by definition. Okay. And we were talking about scientific um, uh, evidence. So are there... 
their scientific evidences of what you're talking about, of these unconscious kind of happenings that go on? Exactly. Uh, and I think this is an important part of the argument because, uh, you know, people have told stories forever about premonition. That's nothing new. But what's new is that within the past five or six years, over 20 controlled experiments have been done around the world by different experimenters showing in computer designed experiments that people can know the future uh, before the computer even makes a selection and uh, so there's no way to fake these tests and they, they show that people undoubtedly have premonitions. They can sense the future. But it's, it, it isn't bunk. People think it's bunk. People think that you really can't tell that. Yes. <laughs> See, the <laughs> argument I get is that skeptics say, well, everybody knows. Yeah, so why right? can't you prevent well, a tragedy if you know? Well, you, often you can. You can. Can I give you an example? <laughs> sure. Well, the book opens uh, with the contention that this stuff helps people survive. It serves a survival function to be able to see the future. Oh, I see. So, uh, in the, uh, one of my favorite examples, a young mother named Amanda, who lives in New York State, had a dream one night where she saw that a ch chandelier fell from the ceiling in her baby's room onto the baby's crib, killed the child, and demolished the crib. This was a horrifying nightmare. She woke up, she told her husband about it. He said it's silly, and he went back to sleep. But she couldn't. She was terrified. She went and got the baby out of the room, brought it back to bed with them. Two hours later, she and her husband were awakened with a crash in the next room, and they go in, and the chandelier has fallen from the ceiling and wrecked oh my the gosh. crib. Had the baby still been there, the baby would have died. Do we always think, though, of premonitions in a negative form? Uh, is it kind of negative? Yeah, they it usually is. warn us of unpleasant things. Uh -huh. So we couldn't but have a premonition to win the lottery. Yes, and people do. I mean, I, <laughs> I got an example in the book of a woman who who dreamt the winning numbers in the lottery not once, but twice. Uh, so it does happen. I mean, people have premonitions about where the last remaining parking spot is in L.A. Right. You know? so, and sometimes I it mean, works. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But people do have premonitions of pleasant things as well as unpleasant things. What should we take away from this book? Well, premonitions are a huge gift. They warn us of unpleasant things. They warn us of health issues that are impending so that we can maybe have a physical examination or a test to prevent something like that. They help us uh, with respect to those we love. For example, Amanda's ability to save her child's life mm -hmm. by heeding the premonition. So they're a huge gift. And I think that what our goal is just to own up to this and to own these phenomena. And if we were to do that, I think we would invite them in our lives so that they would be more effective and more numerous. How can we cultivate that? A uh, couple of ways. The, the single best thing people can do to open up to premonitions is to develop a, a practice of meditation or quieting oh, the mind where you learn to pay attention to what's going on in your inner life so that you become more sensitive to these things when they actually pop up. And another thing that we can do to cultivate them is to keep a dream diary. I was wondering about that because then you can go back and see if there's some kind of... It, Exactly. Line going through it. You can see patterns. You can learn yeah. which ones to trust and which ones not to uh -huh. trust. And also, you know, you'll remember the darn things because usually people, when they wake up, they forget their dreams by the, you know, lunchtime. Right, exactly. So a dream diary helps you hang on to them. Larry, thank you so much for coming today. It's a pleasure. We know. really appreciate having you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. With me is conductor, composer, professor of music, Paul Seiko Chihara. His prize-winning compositions and works have been in major cities. They've been performed in major cities all over the United States and in Europe. And you've heard his music in films, TV series, as well as on, in stage productions. And where do I start with you? Because uh, you were born in Seattle, Washington, yes. uh, and you have a doctorate from Cornell University. Yes. But uh, did you always want to be a musician? Always. 
Oh, you always, always did. <laughs> yes, but I didn't always know I could be a musician. Um, you know, I'm a child of that era where security meant a lot to our parents who came through the Depression. My parents had just come from Japan. They went to Seattle? And they came to Seattle. Most Japanese American, most Japanese came to Seattle first. If you look at the map and you go from Nagoya or one of those cities, uh -huh. you'll come to Seattle, not to Los Angeles. The closest. That's right. And then they, they came down south eventually to San Francisco and mostly the San Joaquin Valley where they were mostly farmers before the oh, Second World War. I see. Um, Far, from farming to that's music. Right. Well, that's an odd story, but a very personal one. I think it, it happened in a relocation camp where my family, where I grew up, actually. Uh, because in those days, we had, um, during the wartime, meaning the Second World War, uh, we were there from 42 to 45, and I was just a young person of four to seven during those years. Were you here or in Colorado? Uh, in Actually, in Idaho. Oh, in Idaho, the, yeah. There were camps all around the Southwest, and, and uh, the one in California, the most famous is Manzanar, where most Californians were relocated. But those of us in the Pacific Northwest went oh, to Minidoka, know. Idaho. Oh, so it was closer, is that yes, it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, there, um, I know my earliest, earliest experiences with um, entertaining people was at the mess hall. Every, every block, there are a number of blocks, had a mess hall, and on Saturdays we had movies. <clears throat> American movies, by the way, and, um, and impromptu performances. And I, I didn't know how to play the violin or the piano then. I was very young, but I sang. So Did I sang, you? Yes, and, and uh, I, I, I sang songs that you wouldn't believe, like, I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places, or my mama then told me, which I always thought was, I was talking about my mama. I didn't at realize. At four that. years old, at four or five years old. And we were pretty <laughs> desperate for entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> but it made a, a cornball out of me even then, and I believe that that carried me through the, the subsequent years in show business. Yes, but your work is not cornball. Your work <laughs> oh, is, yes, it is very... <laughs> It's <laughs> very deep and meaningful. Thank you. You're, and, you're very sweet. <laughs> and, and, to say and that. Really, I mean, um, uh, mind changing mm -hmm. Thank you. in what you've done. Mm -hmm. And you've worked with so many people and yes. you've worked with so many conductors. Yes. Uh, and I've been lucky. I've where been were you blessed. in college? I went to the University of Washington, of Washington in Seattle for three years. And then I went to Cornell University when I, when I received a scholarship, not in music, by the way, but in English and in linguistics. Oh, that's what I was going to ask yeah, you, I why you went to Cornell to well, get your I, doctorate. Well, that's sort of the story of who I am. I was, uh, looking back, I think I was just insecure. I was a very successful young musician in Seattle. I was on television playing the violin, concertmaster of the see. Youth Symphony there. But the idea of becoming a freelance composer or a freelance violinist was really scary for a young man like myself, you know? So you Coming. took violin lessons. Yes. Did, you go to, I, did you go to music school? No. Between university and Cornell? No, I went straight to Cornell, but uh, I, by then I was reasonably well-trained and, and experienced performer on television. Oh, and, I see. And, so you studied <clears throat> then in Paris with? Well, Nadia Boulanger, the great teacher and student of Gabriel Fauré, came to, uh, to the Northeast. She conducted the New York Philharmonic. Oh, is that where Boston. she was? Oh. Well, she's from Paris, of course, yes. but during the Second World War, she relocated to Boston and Cambridge oh. and taught at Radcliffe. Oh. And so she was making a sentimental and successful concert turn return and came by Harvard, Princeton, Cornell. I and see. she heard my music and she said, I'll never forget, she said, you will study with me in Paris. And I said, yes, sir. And you studied in Berlin? Berlin was subsequent. I had a two-year uh, Fulbright to the Hochschule oh, that's in Berlin. Was, yeah. That was during the days of uh, the wall, the Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, so I was very blessed with a good education, Cornell, Paris Conservatoire, uh, Berlin Hochschule. And Tanglewood? And Tanglewood for th <laughs> three summers on scholarship with uh, Gunther Schuller as my mentor. That was what was so fantastic. That's a, that was a, opened a number of doors for me. In fact, he is still considered the great maven of uh, American jazz, the author. And during the years that I studied with him, he was writing his now famous books on the history of jazz. And, um, and there you were <laughs> in camp singing That's some right. of those jazz <laughs> Yes, I know. And so my roots, <laughs> when I started to work in the movies, a lot of people thought that I was 
quitting serious music because I had been working with the LA Philharmonic up until that time and I was already the composer in residence with the LA Chamber Orchestra. That's what I was going to ask Neville you about. Mariner. Neville Mariner. Yeah. It, it so was, you must have been learning from him. Yes and to be honest vice versa too because this was his first major conducting gig. Oh. He had been the principal second violin of the London Symphony and he um, and another colleague of his founded um, a group of concerts in uh, Trafalgar Square at this church oh. called St. Martin's in the Field. Oh, I know that, yeah. Right? Uh -huh. During the late 50s, in which they played chamber music, especially very early and really unknown, now quite well known, uh, Baroque music. Right. Uh, and, they, and the people who, would, it was just at noon, and people would go there, business people would go in there with their sack lunches, right. tourists, students would go, and then they'd go to the British Museum or the whatever, you know. Yeah, portrait, the That's National right. Portrait Gallery. <laughs> yes, it was right, the National Gallery was right across the street there. And, uh, and they put out a number of recordings on a totally unknown LP company called Argo, and, he's, and that was eventually sold to Deutsche Grammophon. Anyways, we're talking about me and not him. But. Well, we're talking about you because um, you had your work at the Marlboro um, yes, Music Marlboro Festival. Yes, Marlboro 1971. That and was, the yeah. L.A. Chamber Orchestra. Yes. And you worked at the Mancini, Henry Mancini yes. Institute yeah. as All a composer in residence. It was one year I was composer in residence, and subsequently I simply became a member of the music faculty teaching and, and so forth. I see. But all of that came subsequent to my experiences on Broadway and in Hollywood. I would not have been asked to be at uh, the Mancini Institute as a teacher if I hadn't already worked in Hollywood. And okay, let's talk about Broadway then. Shogun, mm -hmm. right? I composed Shogun for James Clavell. Before that, I, did the, uh, I was one of the arrangers and the principal music supervisor for Sophisticated Ladies which is the music of Duke Ellington. So there you are, back again. Yeah, you you have that jazz strain it's, it through is your life, my, isn't And it? Gunther Schuller, of course, was an extremely good, he taught me, quote, contemporary classical music, but always with jazz in it. He was the author of something very popular in the 60s called uh, Third Stream. And he worked with the modern jazz quartet and uh, uh. Um, he, he did orchestrations, and, but he was also a fabulous concert French horn player. Oh, is that what it was? He was the youngest member of the New York Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. So when you went to Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. with your Clouds yes. composition, yes. Well, tell us a little bit about well, that. Well, that was commissioned the by the American Composers Orchestra uh -huh. in New York, and it was uh, actually it was the very last concert on the series called the Millennium. They, uh, the American oh, millennium. Composers Orchestra did a series of concerts celebrating the end of the Millennium. Do you remember those years? It seems like a long time ago, no. but <laughs> ten years ago we thought, right. Yes, Were I know we what you're about saying. the Millennium? <laughs> right. Remember we talked about the Millennium like it was going to be the end of the world. I know, but and, it didn't seem like it was ten years ago, all, did it? I know. Well, honey, that's what happens. <laughs> oh, but Clouds was part of Clouds, that? That was part of that, and it, it came on the final concert of that series, the final concert of the end of the previous millennium so oh, so I, I got it yeah and um, and it was also the final concert of Dennis Russell Davies the great conductor who founded that oh it was the first conductor of that orchestra I see and mm -hmm. you spent many years with the San Francisco Ballet yes. were you living up there uh, yes among other places I was the composer in residence with the San Francisco this. Ballet for 15 years uh -huh. uh, I worked with Michael Smeon and with Helgi Thomason and, and this is the, the Tempest, you wrote the whole? I composed, yes, that is the first American full-length ballet produced in the United States. I mean, there are other great ballets written, needless to say, by Stravinsky and, uh, and Copeland. Right. Uh, who, who, who can write better than Appalachian Spring and Billy the Kid and so forth. But those are not full-length ballets, those are basically one-act ballets. Oh, this I is see. a full-length ballet in the tradition of, of Tchaikovsky and Petipa, like it was, or like Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet. But did you use the words or the drama, uh, the influence of Chikak, uh, who was it, Chikak, Chikam Blitzko, no, <laughs> All right. the, the uh, Japanese. Oh, the, do, you, do you mean uh, Japanese Ch drama? Yeah. Chikamatsu? Chikamatsu. Yeah, that's interesting you should say that. Chikamatsu is the great dramatist for no theater, and uh, his I did do one of his, in fact, that's how I got to the San Francisco Ballet. But that was no influence on this. No, no. I see, I see. It influenced that was... the choreographer, though, because he liked my work, and uh, upon the success of the play that I did, the music that I did for a ballet called Shinju. Oh, that's what it which was. Which is a Shin... famous play by Chikamatsu, and it's the Japanese version, you might say, of Romeo and Juliet. 
Oh, I Not see. Romeo and Juliet, but it's as famous as Romeo and Juliet to the Japanese as Romeo and Juliet is to us in the West. Okay, so we can't talk about Pepe Romero, the great guitarist, because yeah. we have to talk about <laughs> Pacific Serenade. Yes. You've been, uh, I've been a commissioned. Very yes, to, and they asked me to write a piano quintet. This is an odd request from them because a piano quintet is somewhat difficult to write. It's it's like two orchestras. A piano is a grand instrument, as you know, and a string quartet is a grand instrument. You put them together, and it's almost like a piano concerto. Well, how long did it take you to write it? Mm, about six months. Oh, that's all? Yes. It's I write very fast. It's such a big thing that you did it in six months. Yeah. Well, where, what is Pacific Serenade? It's a concert series devoted to both contemporary and traditional music, and it's organized uh, largely by a composer, performer, Mark Carlson, who happens to be a colleague of mine at UCLA, a fine composer. He teaches there? He teaches there, and he also plays the flute beautifully. And he had the idea that, we sh that he should uh, sponsor a series, which he has uh, done now for how many years? 20 years? Many years, yeah. Uh, and he has a policy on every concert there is one new work that he oh. that he and his board commission. So is this your first time? No, to... it's actually my fourth time with them. With them. Yeah, oh, he's I see. been very, very generous with me. I can't thank him. And enough. and Pacific Serenades um they they perform in a church on the no, west they, side? Uh, yes and no. They now that's interesting. They do you know, you're right. They do something that I like. They do each concert three or four times. Yes, the different first of venues. Them is, yes, the venues, and but they're the same ones. They're announced at the beginning of the year. I think the first in the series is a church in Pasadena. Yes. And then another concert will be in the home of one of their um, uh, sponsors. And there may even be, and then the third one is at UCLA. What do you teach over there? Uh, I'm the chairman of a brand new program there called Di Visual Media, that is to say film music. Uh -huh. It's only a two-year-old program. Oh. In fact, I've only been a professor there for two years. Oh, well, we're Bef so happy. <laughs> Before that, I still live in New York. I, I commute between New York and here. Oh, you do? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, we're so happy you're here. Well, I'm delighted. <laughs> thank you so much, Paul Chihara, and thank you for watching the show today. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. But email, we love that, jaquinn1 at aol.com. See you next time.